Hello, uh, my name is Ian Todd from BBC Sky Night magazine, um, and I'm here at the International Astronomy Show, and I'm speaking to Professor Lee Fletcher, who is a planetary scientist at the University of Leicester. Uh, Lee, thanks for thanks for taking the time to to, to join me here. Yeah, the, you're the, welcome, no problem. Um, you, you've been here talking about um, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, and all its glory, and um, I mean, at, at the time of, the, of recording, we've, it's only we've only really sort of had say three or four months of of data and images yeah you, Josh, what, the, yeah. the fire hose has opened already effectively so this thing launched back in late 2021 uh christmas day in fact so that very nervous day when everybody was tucking into their turkey and pulling christmas crackers lots of engineers scientists astronomers worldwide were nervously awaiting this incredible launch um but of course, it took a long time to check out all the instruments, to make sure things were working correctly. So the science really didn't get started until the summertime this year. And here we are in October of 2022, and we've already seen a whole raft of incredible images. Some of the data sets that we've been planning for for years and years and years are starting to land on our desk. And I can tell you what, it's been some of the most exciting period of my academic career when that data comes in and you know that it's yours and you've been uh, working for it for so long it's been a tremendous few few months more still to come as well yeah absolutely i mean do, do you sort of have uh, like a, a highlight in terms of the images that the public have seen uh, which are your favorite images well i think maybe my favorite one so far has actually been the neptune image that was released just a, a few weeks ago and part of that was because it came as a surprise to me i had an idea of what was going on with some of the other images but to see Neptune there which is something that we've been wanting to look at for a very long time with JWST um, was just mind-blowing and uh, I, in fact I knew I had an inkling of what was going on but before I saw those fo uh, images on my phone, I was sat with a bunch of planetary scientists out in a meeting in Granada in Spain. And we were sat having lunch and sort of digging into some, some tapas when my phone alerted and said, new Neptune images have just landed. And <laughs> I got to see them for the first time with a bunch of colleagues. And we were all trying to stare at the phone, interpreting what was going on, what were we looking at, what were we seeing. It's just tremendously exciting. So I think I'll remember it more because of the excitement of sitting there analysing it with my friends and colleagues. Absolutely. I mean, it, it must be really um, satisfying, especially considering the the massive journey that, that that the Webb Telescope has gone through, both in terms of the engineering team and then the build-up, and then even just the actual physical journey to, to get out to L2 itself. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to put into words how how ecstatic and over the moon we really are that 12 months ago we were talking about a mission that there was still a huge amount of risk involved the launch itself the, the huge number of deployments that had to take place to actually get this unfolded six and a half metre mirror with this enormous tennis court sized sun shield out to the second Lagrange point and to now be sitting with you today talking about science that that facility is taking is just incredible and testament to the amazing engineers that put this, this thing together some of which were based over my colleagues at the University of Leicester were involved in an instrument that's called MIRI MIRI's um, the only instrument in the complement of JWST that works at the longest wavelength, so light where you're seeing uh, the temperature effectively of all the targets that we're we're looking at and so for them you know they may have been involved in this this mission for 20 years imagine how it must feel to finally see this come to reality and to know it all worked is just an incredible incredible thing so i think you know myself and graduate students and postdocs will be benefiting from their hard work for many many years uh, to come yeah yeah you've, you've you've touched upon a um a good point there with the with the miri instrument like um and it's it's this idea of Webb being um, Hubble's successor mm. and for lay people like me the main difference seems to be that Webb is observing an in infrared yeah. why, why is it doing that what benefit does that give astronomers and planetary scientists yeah, like yourself that's a good question first of all we, we're a bit wary of talking about JWST as a Hubble successor because generally JWST can't do some of the stuff that Hubble can do and it's about the wavelengths ultimately JWST can observe in infrared light which allows you to see light that's being reflected from some of these targets be they cosmological or closer to home solar system targets and also thermal 
light. This is things that Hubble could never do because that works in the ultraviolet and invisible light itself. So to say it's a successor is not, uh, you know, not strictly accurate because they, they need to work together. In fact, some of the most exciting data sets I think we're going to see are where Hubble and JWST are looking at the same target at the same time. I'm really excited about, um, for example, looking at Uranus with both Hubble and Webb at the same time. Uh, but why did we go to the infrared? Well, if you think about the expansion of the cosmos, and Webb wants to really get back to the earliest days of the history of the universe. Now, as the entire universe is expanding, the light that was released from those first stars and galaxies is getting stretched out and stretched out and stretched out. And as it stretches, it shifts from ultraviolet and visible wavelengths out into the infrared. So they'll be bright in the infrared, but basically impossible to see down in the ultraviolet and visible. So Webb was designed to go after that incredibly challenging, very distant, very old light that's come from some of the earliest stars and galaxies. And those of us who do solar system research Search. The infrared is a, is a playground for us as well because there's all these fingerprints of various gases and aerosols and species that are present within planetary atmospheres that we can access with JWST that we could never have done with something like Hubble. So I think JWST for the next 10, 20 years is going to be as good as sending missions out to some of these destinations, certainly for remote sensing. Of course, you really want to be there for sampling magnetic fields and exploring the moons and looking at the rings of these targets. But in terms of the imaging and the spectroscopy, JWST is going to be a treasure trove, I think. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think mo most people would know you for your, your work on Jupiter and as being a, a, a Jupiter expert or a Jupiter planetary scientist. Um, what what is what has JWST shown us so far in terms of Jupiter and the Jovian system? And also, what are you hoping it might reveal? Okay, so Jupiter was chosen as a first target for JWST precisely because it's so challenging. Okay, it's big, and a lot of the instruments can only look at small areas on, on these disks. It's very bright, and a lot of the instruments are so sensitive that it will saturate on Jupiter. And the whole thing is rotating, and the whole thing is moving, and you've got very dim, dark rings and moons next to a big, bright, reflective planet. So it was a really tough challenge for JWST, and we wanted to use it to really showcase some of the capabilities that the observatory had. So, um, uh, Part of the rationale was because it's hard, okay? That's why we wanted to do it. But there's a ton of science that we can get out of it as well. Because some of the regions of the spectrum that we'll be looking at have never been mapped on Jupiter before, not even by visiting spacecraft like Cassini. Juno can't do it up in orbit around Jupiter at the moment. The JUICE spacecraft, it's gonna be there in the 2030s, can't do some of the wavelengths that JWST is gonna be capable of doing. So we wanted to really set a baseline of observation with Jupiter today in 2022 that we can build on over the next 20 years of this mission to watch how the atmosphere is evolving and changing over the course of many years. But you asked me what I was most excited about and this is going to sound a bit strange coming from a, a Jupiter fan like myself. I'm actually most excited about some of the glimpses we're going to get of the satellites of Jupiter. And part of that is because some of these satellites, like Europa, for example, are active satellites. We think they're giving out gazers of material into the nearby circumplanetary space. And those, that material is sampling, potentially, the conditions within the deep, dark, subsurface oceans of a moon like Europa. And if it's being spewed out into space, we can use all of the spectrometers on board JWST to try to figure out what that composition of those oceans might actually be like. So it really gives us a chance to do stuff that normally you could only ever do with a visiting spacecraft. I think that's going to be really exciting in the next few years and, and uh, to come. Absolutely. Um, you, you also touched on in your talk on um, uh, the mystery of the Great Red Spot. I mean, is, is it true that we, 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 still don't, we still don't know a lot about it? Well, you know, we've done a lot of work with the Great Red Spot over many years. We know that this huge vortex has been present for at least a couple of centuries. We know that it's shrinking over time, that it interacts with the, the atmosphere and the winds that surround the Great Red Spot. And we've got an idea from missions like Juno about how deep the Great Red Spot goes now into the deep, deep atmosphere. But there are still some mysteries that remain unsolved. And one of the key ones, and this is a little bit embarrassing for planetary scientists, is we don't know what the chemical substance is that makes the Great Red Spot 
red. We've got some ideas. We, it could be phosphorus, it could be sulfur, it could be weird chemical gunk raining down from above, from high up in the atmosphere. But we don't have that unique signature or uh, fingerprint, if you like, of what that material is. So whenever you get access to a new wavelength range, like JWST is providing us with, it gives you the, the possibility, not the certainty, but the possibility that maybe you'll see that unique spectral signature for the first time. We have now maps of Jupiter's great red spot, and we are pouring over them, trying to model and analyze that data to see whether we can see any unique fingerprints uh, within, that, within that region. So watch this space, I would say, but Webb gives us the chance to do it. It's absolutely incredible. And one of the other things that was really interesting in your talk was you're talking about um, uh, Webb uh, analyzing the other bodies of the solar system, for example, like the asteroid belt, but also even like uh, sort of transient uh, events like uh, interstellar yeah, yeah. visitors and uh, comets. Yeah, so if the, the, the challenge with JWST is because it's such a big facility and it has to be kept cold it's got that whopping great sun shield on its side it's always got to keep the sun shield between the sensitive telescope and the sun so it can only look at certain parts of the sky at certain times of the year so it's not like saying oh look there's an interstellar visitor coming in or look there's a uh, comet coming into the inner solar system only if they're in the right field of regard of the observatory can we actually point the facility at that object but if it's there and if we have that opportunity we've got programs ready to go on JWST that would maybe sample the chemical composition of an interstellar object or maybe be able to characterize the the debris field resulting from an impact on Jupiter a big comet or a big asteroid striking Jupiter and actually there is something that it's worth emphasizing is that JWST won't be able to react instantaneously to these changes. It's got an incredible program of observations that are programmed weeks, if not months, in advance. So say something smacks into Jupiter, or say an interstellar object comes in, we'll be relying on other facilities, both amateur astronomers and professional astronomers, to tell us that something exciting is going on and where the telescope would need to point. Then we need to basically trigger these programs that we've got already planned to slew the telescope and point. It won't be instantaneous, but hopefully it will be within a few days or weeks of the exciting announcement uh, taking place. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, will you be sort of going, quick, 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 we're going to miss it? <laughs> well, I think there'll be an element of that and we'll be pushing very hard. Of course, we have a rough idea of how long some of the debris hangs around on Jupiter from an impact from a comet or asteroid. But uh, yes, we'll be pushing for things happening as fast as possible. But of course, as I say, it has to be if the object is in the right place in the sky for something like JWST to, to go looking at it. Yeah. Um, in, in between my first email to you about meeting you here and now, um, the, there's, there's been a pretty cool news story that, that's come out of the University of Leicester, which I believe that you were involved in. And it's these amazing, it's the, the sharpest images of Europa and Ganymede ever captured by a ground-based telescope. Yeah, that's, we were really proud of that, that study. And it was actually led by a PhD student at the University of Leicester called Oliver, Oliver King. I was his supervisor, but he did the lion's share of the work. But what... Um, so uh, you're familiar with the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, the JUICE spacecraft? Well, this is Europe's first mission to the Jovian system. It's going to launch next year in 2023. It's got a whole raft of instruments to explore the icy satellite. But back about five, six years ago, we thought, hmm, I wonder if we can take some data now with the best telescopes on Earth that will allow JUICE to really focus its observation when it gets to Europa and Ganymede in the 2030s. So we, en uh, we enlisted the help of the very large telescope out in Chile and an instrument that was actually designed to do extreme what they call adaptive optics to remove all the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere and look and do direct imaging of extrasolar planets. So we said what about turning that to solar system objects? And we looked at Europa and we looked at Ganymede and we watched as those moons moved around Jupiter so that we could map the entire surface of those worlds. And we did that with spectroscopy, meaning that we could then fit the spectra with our models to say something about the ices, something about the acids, something about the salts that were present on their surface. And as a wonderful byproduct, we get the highest resolution observations of Europa and Ganymede that I think have ever been taken from Earth. Okay, and that's, I mean, you've seen the images, they look absolutely stunning. And of course, this means that when JUICE and Europa Clipper, the American spacecraft, 
get to Europa, we can maybe help to target and pinpoint objects, uh, regions of interest on their surfaces. We also want to do Callisto, but we're hoping that the Callisto observations will come in the next 12 months or so from the VLT uh, to give us another comparison to Ganymede and, and to Europa. So watch this space, I suppose, for those. Um, what about IO? IO has been done already. Just hasn't been published yet. Wow. So it's out there in the data set. So we've got some crisp <laughs> images of IO as well. But that's, uh, watch this space for those. Because, I mean, you know, IO is obviously is an absolutely incredible. I mean, it's, it's completely different to the other three Galilean moons, isn't it? Yeah, so, so Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, mostly, well, they're icy, rocky bodies. But what we see on the surface is, that is the water ice with contaminants on them. Whereas IO is so close into Jupiter that it formed primarily of rocky material. And volcanism is still going on to this day on the IO surface. Every time a spacecraft has flown past IO, it's witnessed the eruption of a volcano. And we, with things like JWST, you'll be able to see the hot spots and the chemicals that have been pumped out by these, these IO volcanoes. So with things like the VLT, then you can see the volcanic uh, regions, the lava fields that are present on the surface of Io. So like I say, watch this space for those images when we get to get the time to analyze that data. Absolutely incredible. It, it really seems like uh, all eyes are in Jupiter now with these with these images and with the, the upcoming missions. Do you, do you, do you ever think about um, the necessity for um, uh, you know uh, robotic missions to visit the other three um, <laughs> uh, planets out there? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, um, I think, Things like the Cassini mission, right, that was first developed in the early 1980s, launched in the 1990s, then its science was incredible right through to 2017 when it came to an end. You think that's a 37-year period of people's whole careers, right? So you have to start getting, you have to plan early for the next generation of space missions. The JUICE mission launching in 2023 was originally envisaged back in the early 2000s and only formally sort of uh, accepted and adopted as a mission in the early 2010s. Ten years later, it's finally heading out to, to the launch pad. So you have to get started now on what's the next big thing going to be. To me, the destinations in our solar system which have really not been well studied by Uranus and Neptune. And they had their single flyby by the Voyager 2 spacecraft back in the 1980s. But since then, We've just had to rely on ground-based telescopes, and now JWST, to take data. There's no substitute, though, for being there in orbit around Uranus and Neptune to really explore these ice giants as an intermediate category of planet between big things like Jupiter and small rocky things like the Earth. And I think we've got, here in our solar system, a perfect example of the most common outcome of the whole planetary formation process. When we look out at these exoplanets, many of them have similar sizes to Uranus and Neptune. And so we need to be exploring our exoplanets, if you like, the exoplanets in our backyard in order to, to understand something about this pantheon of planets uh, elsewhere. So the hope is that in the next few years, we'll start building a mission to Uranus. Uranus is the next one on the, on the cards. And then maybe in the early 2030s, we'll launch a Uranus mission that will fly out to Uranus and get there in the mid 2040s and be taking data, hopefully around about the time I'm retiring. <laughs> That's the plan. So you have to be in it for the long haul with these, these missions. Um, presumably in the meantime, though, um, the Webb Telescope is going to be giving us so much data yes. and, and images of, of Uranus and Neptune and Saturn. Yes, in fact, uh, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are all programmed in, targeted by JWST in the next 12 months. So that, that like I said, the floodgates really are open from JWST. We will get our best infrared spectroscopy and imaging of all the giant planets in the next 12 months. It's a really great time to be working uh, in this field. And of course, you know, think about the alternate reality where this hadn't all worked out and JWST wasn't taking its data. We'd then be thinking, what on earth are we gonna do next to, to really advance these fields? But we do live in the reality, the one reality out of billions where it's all working really well <laughs> and working both perfectly. So. Fantastic, well, uh, lots to look forward to. Um, yep. Lee, thanks very much for taking the time to speak to me. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on the, on the podcast. You're welcome. Have a great time. Cool. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.